we really want to recognize midwives. I personally, I really want to recognize midwives and put midwives where they belong. We want, now that we understand what our mothers want, eh, we really want to give them what they need. How do we give them what, do we, what they need? Is by also understanding what midwives want. So we already understand what midwives want, we already understand what um, our women want, and so we are ready to give them. And as a midwife, I'm going to advocate to other midwives to really, really meet the needs of these mothers. I want to advocate even to our offices, to our managers, to speak with them. Let them listen to the midwives. Let them understand what midwives really want, whether in terms of resources, in terms of even funding. Let the midwives participate when it comes to budgeting issues because it is the midwife who really understands what she needs that is best for that client to reduce our maternal mortalities. My wish is that uh, midwives should be given space so that they can work. And also they should be appreciated by the employer so that whatever they need in terms of commodities or supplies should be available to that person, to the midwife, so that she or he can work well. Well, I would also like to add as also a trainer that um, the, the nursing council should push forward to have a few more midwifery training programs, schools, so that uh, we create a critical mass that would ensure that uh, we scale down maternal mortality. We may not be able to really uh, say that we can completely do away with the maternal mortality, but we can scale it down. One thing that I would really love uh, for midwifery is uh, to be able to engage more uh, nurses and midwives specialized and trained in midwifery so that we can be able to offer quality care services uh, to our clients. And as an institution and as an individual, passionately I would want to be part of the individuals that can be able to produce uh, more numbers in terms of midwifery. Uh, individuals are specialized in midwifery and to be able to um, be able to partake in the outcome of the quality service delivery that are going to be given to our clients in our country and even beyond our country. We really want to recognize midwives. I personally, I really want to recognize midwives and put midwives where they belong. We want, now that we understand what our mothers want, eh, we really want to give them what they need. How do we give them what, do we, what they need? Is by also understanding what midwives want. So we already understand what midwives want, we already understand what um, our women want, and so we are ready to give them. And as a midwife, I'm going to advocate to other midwives to really, really meet the needs of these mothers. I want to advocate even to our offices, to our managers, to speak with them. Let them listen to the midwives. Let them understand what midwives really want, whether in terms of resources, in terms of even funding. Let the midwives participate when it comes to budgeting issues because it is the midwife who really understands what she needs that is best for that client to reduce our maternal mortalities. Welcome everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, you are now joining the National Virtual Roundtable on Midwives' Voices, Midwives' Demands. 
Thank you for uh, taking time to join us today. Uh, we'll be starting, starting uh, the meeting. Um, kindly uh, introduce yourselves on the chat box. Tell us where you're from, your name, your county, whether you're a midwife, a support of a midwife, um, and we'll record that. We are, uh, we are so many, so we really want to introduce ourselves on the chat box. If we try the other way around, we might kill all the time. Um, and just want to tell you that this is a safe and brave space. Uh, we'll be having a virtual uh, roundtable conversation. So we will not discriminate on opinion. We will not, um, we'll allow people to uh, express their views. So feel free, feel free to do that using the chat box function and the, raise, and the, um, the hand function to, to express your views. Um, I will kickstart this session. I just also want to say that uh, the roundtable has been organized by White Chiefs Alliance Kenya in partnership with the Midwives Associ Association of Kenya. And we are uh, really happy to host you um, here today. Kindly uh, mute you. <laughs> Sandra, you're muted. Oh my good, oh, was I muted all this time? You went off just when you said, kindly mute yourselves. <laughs> oh, I was muted, someone muted me. <laughs> someone muted me, I think when they're trying to mute the rest. All right, um, let's get this started. Uh, Maureen, kindly uh, place the uh, slide deck on so that we can we can move. Again, my name is Sandra Moranya. I will be moderating this session. Uh, it's an uh, exciting conversation to have. We have very um, important people uh, speaking here today, including participating here today to have this um, midwives conversation. I, I believe it should be an inaugural roundtable because I understand that such conversations haven't been taking place. Um, and so it's, it's quite exciting to be, to be part of this. So uh, next slide, please. We are White Urban Alliance Kenya, um, a powerful network of advocates working for maternal, newborn, sexual, reproductive, and adolescent health and rights, uh, operating at the subnational level and the national level. We work by mobilizing citizens to help them recognize and seize their power to demand that all women, girls, and their babies are safe, healthy, before, during, and after pregnancy. So we care about maternal health. Next slide, please. Why we do this is because we recognize that every day in Kenya, 23 women, adolescent girls included, die in pregnancy or child death, childbirth. And most of these deaths are preventable. This number is by are from the, the previous KDH. KDHS, the Demographic Health Survey. So we might get more now, uh, the updated numbers this year uh, once the report comes out. But this is as is. This is what has. Um, uh, that this is the current state of affairs. Adolescent mothers are on the increase, with one in every five girls in Kenya pregnant already a mother. So that is something that concerns us. So we focus our efforts on maternal, newborn, sexual, reproductive, and adolescent health because research has shown us, including this survey, when women are healthy. Children, families, communities, and countries thrive. And that is what we want. That is what we aim to have. Our mission is to catalyze and convene citizen-led advocacy and accountability movement that ensures that the health and the well-being of women and girls in pregnancy, childbirth, and the postnatal uh, period. Next, uh, next slide, please. How we do this is that we understand that we help citizens understand <laughs> that they have power to hold their duty bearers accountable. So we mobilize them uh, to hold their duty bearers accountable for the promises that have been made and how the money has been spent. But we also work together with duty bearers and decision makers um, uh, in, this, in this regard to ensure that they respond to the needs of citizens. And citizens here are the women, the girls, the mothers and the adolescents that we work with, because we believe that these rights holders, they have rights and they have entitlements um, that are embedded in our constitution and other human rights instruments. So we hope we work towards um, ensuring that those rights are protected um, and promoted. Next slide, please.
Sandra, I've lost you. Uh, Sandra, you've muted yourself. I, I am being muted. I don't know what's happening. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Oh, great, great. Um, so for us to ensure that we cultivate a meaningful relationship between the citizens, the women, the girls, the adolescents, and the duty bearers and decision makers, like the health service providers and the health workers, um, it's important that we build trust and accountability so that there's long-term change and citizen-led change. And what we call, this is what we call the feedback loop. And this is something that we are trying to um, um, harness with this conversation. Next slide, please. So what women, what women want campaign is what sort of kick-started the work that we're doing around with you. Again, because we are very keen on the voices of the mothers, the voices of the women and the girls, because they're the ones who are leading the process. We are very keen on finding out what does quality of care mean to mothers? In Kenya, this was actually kick-started and, 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 and triggered by the Lancet report, the confidential um, inquiry into preventable uh, maternal deaths, where we found out that uh, uh, quality of care was a top-rated um, issue that was contributing to poor maternal and newborn health outcomes. Uh, so we launched this campaign to actually go out and ask women and girls across the world to tell us what is the one priority, one request for maternal and reproductive health care services. And so that campaign from the responses that we had, it sparked a revolution. It gave the women and girls the power and the voice to speak out and tell us what, what, what it is that they, um, that they valued, what it is that they used to define health and a quality of care in, in health. Um, and the results were far beyond what you and me as health workers, as programmers, as policy makers understand as definition of quality. Next slide. The top four ranking health requests that came from women and girls for them to say that they received quality reproductive and maternal health care um, services was increased, competent, and um, better supported midwives. And that is something that resonated across the movement, across age groups, women and girls. Um, to, fully, to fully realize the demand for midwives, we then needed to understand, okay, now we've heard from the women and girls, right? So what about the midwives? What do they themselves need um, to ensure that they deliver this quality care um, that the women and the girls have demanded for and have requested for? And this is what kick-started this campaign, um, which is called the Midwives Voices, Midwives Demands um, campaign. But we sought to now listen to the voices of midwives across the world. Over 56,000 midwives from around the world have raised their voices and shared their demands. And this forum today is, um, organized for us to hear what they have said, what they have said um, uh, towards uh, what they need to deliver their role, uh, to deliver quality care and quality newborn and maternal uh, care. Next slide, please. For this campaign, uh, we did not do it ourselves. Uh, it is a global campaign and we are a global organization. So we did partner with the International uh, Confederation of Midwives at the global level uh, with partners, but also at national level, we partnered with the Midwives Associ Association of Kenya to launch the Midwives Voices, Midwives Demands under the PUSH campaign. And we do have uh, representatives from the PUSH campaign on the call here today. The initiative heard directly from midwives about their needs and their wants, including what matters most most to them, and to bring that knowledge and pressure to bear on policymakers as they consider midwifery investments. We are currently in the decade of the midwife and the nurse uh, that was declared two years ago by WHO uh, when the COVID was really rampant. And we recognize that the role of midwives and nurses has never been more, has never been clearer than it has now as frontline workers for women, girls, adolescents, children, and newborn. It is important to actually bring investments for midwifery um, across the world, but especially here in Kenya. And that is the, the call that we've heeded to. To date, the Midwives Voices, Midwives Demands campaign has connected with over 56,000 56, health providers in over 101 countries. The scale of this campaign has eclipsed all previous efforts to reach and hear from midwives. Now is the moment. Now is the moment to build that momentum. And that is where we are here today. 
Now, before we, we, we dive into the findings that will be presented by my colleague uh, from the Midwifery Association of Kenya, I would like to invite um, Professor Eunice Dirangu to speak on the national um, context, give us a national uh, context for midwifery. Uh, she'll deliver, she'll share with us some key levers that are needed for strengthening the uh, midwifery workforce in Kenya to ensure this high quality reproductive maternal and newborn uh, healthcare services. And she'll also speak to some of the recent developments that have happened around the midwifery uh, workforce. Uh, Professor Ndirangu is, holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Eastern Africa, Baraton, Kenya, and a master's in advanced nursing practice and a PhD in nursing studies from the University of Nottingham and uh, United, uh, the United Kingdom. Her areas of expertise are sociological aspects of HIV AIDS prevention, care and support, health policy, mental well-being and resilience and higher education. She has attended numerous conferences and published, throughout the, and published throughout the span of her academic career on a variety of topics. Dr. Dirangu is an associate professor, a fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK and holds a postgraduate certificate of teaching in higher education from Oxford Brookes University, UK. Apart from her current position, which is the chair of the uh, chairperson of the, Nash, uh, the Nursing Council of Kenya, uh, she's a board member of the One Girl Can Philanthropist, an organization dedicated to enhancing gender equality through improving the status of the girl child in Kenya. Welcome, Eunice. We're really glad to have you. Thank you very much, Sandra. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. It is indeed an honor to speak uh, or share my thoughts uh, this evening. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, a huge disclaimer that I always give every time somebody asks me to give a keynote is I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the solutions to all the problems. But I always believe that by and large, every time we sit to have a conversation, it kind of sets us off in the right direction in terms of exploring how we can handle the issues at hand and then moving that conversation onwards into action. So on, on 5th May, and I guess this meeting is happening at an opportune month when we talk about celebrating the International Day of the Midwife and the International Nurses Day, uh, we celebrated the International Day of the Midwife on 5th of May. And there was a lot to celebrate, obviously, in terms of the milestones that have been achieved in the last 100 years and the progress that has been there when it comes to the midwifery profession. But it was also a time to reflect on the amount of work that is there that is yet to be done. I have to start by saying that reflecting on the International Nurses, rather International Midwifery Day, one of the key things, obviously, that comes to the fore is the fact that access to sexual and reproductive healthcare is a fundamental human right. And that is something we need to remind ourselves throughout this day. It's a fundamental human right for every girl and for every woman to have access to sexual and reproductive health. Now we do know that lack of access is more or less correlated to the fact that women have economic disempowerment generally, but they also tend to face gender-based violence. And those are two critical elements that affect access. The reality also is that we cannot talk about universal health coverage unless we can ensure that sexual and reproductive health needs, maternal and midwifery needs are actually met by the population. If you look at the sustainable development goals, the one around, uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm at home and there's a lot happening. Yes, we can hear you clearly. You can yes. hear me. Perfect, yeah. perfect. So that means my noise cancellation earphones are working because there's some drilling happening around me. So like okay. I was saying, if you look at the sustainable development goals, let's look at development goal number three that talks about now poverty. If you look at poverty levels in the world, women are most, you know, face uh, the greatest levels of poverty. If you look at uh, access to good health and well-being across the populations and across the, the, the life, the age, age bracket, again, we see women and girls as less disadvantaged when it comes to that access. Uh, if you look at SDG number four on quality education, we do know when it comes to access of education that women and girls have less access to education. You have less access to education. It means you have lower socioeconomic status, which essentially means that your access to healthcare and your general well-being gets affected. We know in Kenya that thousands of women and girls lose their lives 
due to preventable complications during pregnancy and childbirth. And if you look at the 2021 state of World's Midwifery Report by the World Health Organization, the ICM and UNFPA, we know that the global shortage for midwives stands at over 900,000. And this is particularly acute in Africa. The same report shares that midwives are critical to achieving greater successes in the, in the, in the status of, of uh, the, the population, particularly women. And we know it calls for greater investments in four key areas, education and training, health workforce planning, management and regulation, and the work environment, leadership and governance, and, self, um, and service delivery. It's interesting to note, as I'll speak later about the nursing and midwifery policy, that these four elements are actually addressed and covered in the nursing policy that was launched recently. The What Women Want campaign that Sandra has briefly talked about and the report, it made, it's made it very, very clear that midwives want access to supplies and functional facilities because it's difficult to provide care and support if you do not have the relevant resources that you need to do so. They need more and better supported personnel professional development and leadership, respect, dignity, and non-discrimination, as well as power, autonomy, and improved gender norms and policies. The 2020 State of Nursing uh, report by WHO similarly demonstrated that the challenges that we have around gender inequality are very reflective of the nursing and midwifery profession. Why? Because it's a highly gendered, gendered uh, profession. So the same challenges around remuneration and support and incentives apply uh, to the profession, perhaps at a greater, at a greater extent because of, of those um, challenges. Now, some of these aspects are already being addressed by government reforms, uh, by state agencies, but also by non-state agencies. And I'll give examples, for instance, of what Aga Khan University, the regulators, the associations are doing. So one such initiative that has been convened by the Aga Khan University a School of Nursing and Midwifery and supported by the Ministry of Health, funded by Johnson & Johnson Foundation, the Nursing Council of Kenya, UNFPA, and the associations across the country, including the Midwifery Association of Kenya that is in, in, on the call today. This initiative is labeled the Nurse and Midwifery Alliance, and it seeks to develop several things, and I'll mention a few. And the details of this will get from the Registrar Nursing Council who's on the call. Some of the key critical elements have been the development of a nursing and midwifery policy, the review of the scheme of service for nurses and midwives, scopes of practice for specialist training, including the midwifery training. For me, this is a very, very good example of what happens when you convene all players into one platform so that they're able to achieve great milestones for the midwifery. As we work on all these initiatives that we are discussing here today, I think the several key areas touched on by What Women Want campaign and the uh, State of World Midwifery Report, which of course looks at integrating everyone within the midwifery profession, improving intersectoral collaboration. So ideally we should not be having conversation about midwifery if we do not have other stakeholders because they also have a probably a key gatekeepers in things that we need to do to achieve this. Offering of education and training to midwives as well as enhancing the image and professional standing of midwifery practice in the country. I want to really recognize and appreciate the Ministry of Health for the focus they have put in the nursing and midwifery um, profession. Uh, for those who had the privilege of joining us either physically or virtually uh, at the coast on 6th of May, you have the CS for Health and the DG for Health place a lot of emphasis and their commitment to the midwifery and nursing profession. And I do recall him asking somebody from the Midwifery Association of Kenya to stand and, and recognize that midwives really play a critical role. But he also reminded us that it's not just about the skills, it's, not about the, it's also about the soft skills that help in, improve, in making our mothers and girls feel comfortable when they're being provided care for by a midwife in any part of the country. Now, wearing my other hat as the Dean of Nursing and Midwifery at Aga Khan University, uh, reducing a great deficit of midwives across the region by offering quality education and training and upgrading skills through continuous professional education is something that we have been very committed at doing. Uh, Aga Khan was the first to start the Battle of Science in Midwifery degree, which provides a pure midwifery upgrading exit criteria at the degree level. 
we've also started the Masters of Science in Advanced Practice um, at Wifri, and I thank the Nursing Council for taking the initiative of, of, of kind of thinking out of the box and starting to see how we can create opportunities to enhance specialist midwifery training. We've also seen how developing partnerships helps. The Elma Philanthropist, for instance, has on the last three years supported Aga Khan University to provide scholarships, and I mean full tuition and upkeep scholarship for midwives to undertake the Bachelors of Science midwifery upgrading program and the focus was in representation from the 47 county. And we did see us have in our classroom, nurses from Lamu, Garissa, Kilifi, West Pokot, Turkana, to mention but a few. Because in the end, this is not just about the total numbers, it's also about the distribution of midwives across the counties in this country. So what does the way forward look like or some of the elements we need to think about? The first touch point is midwifery education. We need to train midwives and focus on the standards and competencies that are applied by ICM. The move towards a competency-based curriculum is something that is a national move. We saw this during the February Health Workforce Conference, and we saw how much emphasis the Ministry of Education that was represented by uh, Professor Magoha, as well as the Ministry of Health that was represented by the CS. And I do believe the president also um, was in attendance at that health workforce conference. A lot of conversation and emphasis on competency-based curriculum. And this is a challenge for all of us. I know we all tend to be moved by seeing content and lots of content, but content doesn't get us anywhere. It's the competencies. And whilst we have had the Kenya Registered Community Health Nurse exit criteria, we do need to think about how do we augment this with pure midwife training? We do need to think about pure midwifery training out of the, of, the, uh, of the bachelor's level, for instance. If you look at developed countries, nursing is distinct from midwifery. In a, in a lot of our African countries, it is integrated. That distinction needs to happen for us to be able to say that we are having a critical mass of midwives with the relevant skill sets out there, providing care where it's needed the most. The other thing we need to do is you know, make midwifery education attractive and value, create value for midwifery as a profession. Earlier, while you were playing the, the videos, somebody indicated that you know, we need to open more midwifery um, training institutions, but I'll challenge back to all of us and ask how many nurses, how many midwives apply for midwifery programs? I can tell you for the two midwifery programs we run, the Bachelor of Science in midwifery and the Masters in Advanced Practice midwifery, it is actually a struggle to fill the classrooms. But when I see midwives as passionate as those who are on the call today, I think to me that passion is enough to get more people encouraged to do midwifery. I remember training and working in the hospitals early on in my career and being allocated in the midwifery unit, in the maternity unit was like a punishment. It need not be, it needs to be something that is valuable and honored. And we need to create that perception across uh, the various health facilities. The other element on the way forward is learning institutions. How well prepared are the institutions to provide quality education? We focus a lot on being busy and providing clinical work, which by and large needs to be done. But how are we overcoming other systemic barriers? What are we doing in our own way to do that? Think of innovation and creativity when providing education. For instance, use of simulation. I can tell you from my own experience as an educator, as a dean at Aga Khan, I've seen a huge difference when we are using our simulation center, for instance, to teach certain skill sets to our midwives. Because what happens is they get endless and limitless opportunity to create scenarios that often by and large they may not find in the clinical setting, but most importantly to practice, 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 so that then when they're in the clinical setting and they are faced with certain um, scenarios, they're able to think through and you know, utilize those skills they have earned over time to be able to provide quality care. We need to think about supportive and mentorship. I mean, we have amazing midwives. There are many midwives I admire. Um, the late um, Louisa, for me, was a good example. She just made me want to be a midwife, although my midwifery skills are not quite something right home about. But she always made me feel like midwifery is something to be passionate about. I think we need a lot of those and we need clear, intentional efforts towards mentorship. 
at all levels so that whatever happens at the national level, it is augmented by what's happening on the ground. Uh, the other thing is around reviewing and implementing career progression guidelines. And this has to first uh, be supported by work analysis and skills staff. We need to know where the numbers are, what are the appropriate numbers, so that when we are saying we need more midwives, we are using evidence to say that. I saw a discussion recently where somebody said, but it's obvious that there's a problem. No, it is obvious there's a problem, yes, but what is the evidence telling you? It's a lot easier to get things moving. And I can tell you this from my experience over the last one and a half years with the nursing platform, the, the nursing and midwifery alliance. The reason we've been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve is going to people who hold the power to make decisions and implement policy with evidence, not just telling them, but we know there's a problem. The other thing is, of course, appropriate deployment and retention policies need to be implemented. Now, we know the Agathan University, the support of Johnson & Johnson Ministry of Health, recently launched the nursing and midwifery policy. And I want to point out some key areas that this nursing and midwifery policy talks about. It talks about enhancing mid education and research for midwifery, workforce planning and management for midwifery, accelerating uh, midwifery services across all ages and all levels of care, strengthening the regulatory landscape for midwifery, governance and leadership in midwifery, as well as financing and partnerships in midwifery. Of course, we cannot talk about this and not talk about remuneration and incentive. And we are currently reviewing the scheme of service and the scope of practice for midwives. And I'll leave Edna, the registrar and CEO of, of Nursing Council, to expand more on this when her time comes. The final element I want to talk about is the creation of an enabling environment. We need to remember that healthcare is a collaborative and a multi-sectoral initiative. It's not a one-person shop. We need that and we need the correct and appropriate infrastructure, technologies, HRH, and most importantly, leadership and governance. And allow me for two seconds here to provide a little bit of clarity on leadership. I often find that we think of leadership from the perspective of who holds a position of authority. But I want to challenge all the midwives on the call today. Leadership, everyone is a leader in their own way where they are. Each of us has an opportunity, no matter how small, to make a change and to lead. So as we think about leadership and governance, let's not look out up, up rather than looking inwards and asking ourselves where we can uh, work in terms and, and provide support. One other element is empowerment and empowerment of civil society, such as the Midwifery Association of Care of Kenya. And I'm really excited that Aga Khan has had a long standing relationship with Mark and engaged them in a lot of things around supporting them to develop their strategic plans, for instance, and empower them so that they are able to also empower their members so that they can together in a collaborative and unison voice put forward key elements. So as I end, I want to say that midwives are perhaps the largest and often the only source of maternal reproductive newborn child and sexual uh, services to populations across the various levels of care. So with time and more consistent efforts, the fruits of what we are doing here today will obviously result in improved care. But my call today for all of us would be that we need to synergize our efforts so that we are not each of us doing our little thing in our little corner. Rather, we need to come together so that we engage through a process of convening like we're doing today. You know, identify needs, prioritize them, and then agree on who does what with a common outcome and a common goal in mind. A, con a convening meeting such as this one is a good place to start. And for sure, we just need to remember that when we find ourselves drowning in a multitude of challenges and problems, the default thing to do is to complain and finger point. I ask all of us, let's not get stuck into that you know, vicious cycle. Let's ask ourselves, what can we do, no matter how small, to enhance midwifery education and practice in this country in order to improve the health of women and quality of care? So whilst we get that support from Ministry of Health, let us also in our own way be able to augment that. Thank you very much and thanks for listening to me. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ndirangu. That has been a very powerful analysis of what the midwifery landscape looks like right now. I think, I, 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 I'm sure many will agree with me that there's a lot that they've learned that they did not know about, um, including myself as an advocate. I think 
Um, just what you, your call on synergy, on synergy is so important because it is true. Many of us work in silos and yet we are working towards the same goal. So I think it is, it is also up to us. It's a, it's a challenge to even us as advocates and, and players in, the, in this sector to actually be very strategic and, 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 and intentional about collaborating together and more importantly, bringing the midwife's voice into this conversation. And that's what we're gonna do next. Um, uh, the next speaker, um, Ms. Yunis Atsali, Nyasiri Atsali, is going to present to us uh, what the midwives have said. We talk to midwives across the world, like I said, 56,000 of them. In Kenya, we uh, were able to have conversations with about 3,500 um, on what they said and what they believe would they need to improve their role as a midwife so that um, the, the quality care is delivered. And so Ms. Yunis Atsali is going to be presenting those top line findings. What are those top priorities that the midwives in Kenya have told us? Um, that they need to deliver in their role. Um, and she's also going to be telling us, uh, um, giving us perspective from where she sits. So Ms. Uh, Eunice Nyasiri Atsali is a lecturer in midwifery at Kenyatta University. Uh, she's also the vice chair at, um, of the Midwifery Association of Kenya and in charge of research education and advocacy committee. She's currently a PhD candidate at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, her research interest is in maternal clinical guidance, normally in birth, normality in birth, sorry, empowering midwifery in both clinical and community settings and adolescent health. Uh, she has participated in various policy development uh, issues uh, dealing with maternal and newborn health. And so Eunice, we are very happy for you to present to us the findings from the listening exercise that took place um, last year and this year around uh, what midwives want to deliver in their role as a, to deliver in their role. Welcome, Eunice. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. I hope Maureen is going to share. Is she sharing? Yes, it's coming right up. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And I want to appreciate all the midwives and all the participants that have attended this meeting. I know uh, you've sacrificed your time and we appreciate you as Midwives Association of Kenya in conjunction with the White Ribbon Alliance. So um, during the survey that was conducted um, in last year and this year, um, the healthcare workers that were surveyed include 35% of them were midwives and 26% uh, were nurse midwife or nursing professional with midwifery training. Then 25% uh, were student midwives or apprentices. 7% who participated in this survey were nursing professionals and lady health visitors 3% and other healthcare professionals were 4%. Next please. So uh, the profile of the midwives that were um, surveyed uh, included, I think Professor Yuni spoke about um, midwifery being a gendered profession. And it's true, as you can see from the results of 57% of the people who were surveyed were female and 43% uh, were male and others preferred not to say. Of course, we have intersexual, intersexual and intergender uh, people. So the ages that were surveyed, the demographics, um, the majority are between 20 and 24 years. So they are pretty young and this gives us a potential because as a profession, when you have younger professionals, then there is a possibility of growth. Of course, we have uh, others 25 to uh, to 34 years were 39%. And then we have a small percentage, which is 3%. And remember, we need mentors in midwifery. So I think this is something to think about because if we have less mentors for the younger professionals, then it becomes very difficult. So I hope we are going to increase the numbers as we go by. Next. Yeah. So I'll speak a bit about uh, this slide. Um, 
the number from the survey that was done, the top ask by the midwives in Kenya, and remember 3,532 midwives were interviewed and participated in this campaign. So the top asks by the midwives, by you, some of you are here. One was supplies and functional facilities, which, is, which was topmost ask. 47% of you requested for um, access to protective equipment and gear and availability of bathing beds. And of course, there are many, many other supplies that we need as midwives that I know midwives may have requested. Then 24% uh, of you requested more and better supported personnel. And in this case, I think it still stands up to today that midwives are, majority of midwives are underpaid within the country. And I like the fact that Professor Ndirangu has spoken about uh, the scheme of service that maybe I'm hoping is going to look into renumeration of midwives because midwives are highly specialized um, individuals that actually put a lot of efforts in their work and therefore midwives are requesting for increased salaries and of course additional staff and I want to speak a little bit about this additional staff I like the challenge you've given us Professor Ndirangu that it is not just about the additional staff but the distribution so it is very important that, of course, as Midwives Association and, of course, with the partners, we will have to look into this and, you know, try and check how many midwives do we have out there? And are they meeting the, the needs of the, mid of the women? Because women requested that they want more midwives. And, of course, even midwives are requesting that they need additional staff because at, at the moment what is happening staff are so few in midwifery facilities that they become overworked. Then 11% of the midwives um, requested for general health and health services. And I believe what midwives are talking about is care. For example, ergonomic training. If I'm provided with better, better bathing beds, and of course, better uh, um, uh, uh, facilities in the labor ward, then there's a possibility I may be able to have better back health. But then if the beds that I'm given to help women bath from are compromising my health, then I think that is something that we need to think about. And then of course, generally, you may find midwives in public services that do not have a medical cover. So I think this is something that we need to think about. Um, the other thing midwives asked for is professional development and leadership. And one of the things that uh, was highlighted in all these was professional growth opportunities. And I believe the scheme of service that is being developed will be able to address this aspect. We have a representative from Midwives Association of Kenya that is representing us in this. And we would like to speak about uh, professional growth. As a midwife, once I have achieved my midwifery skills and also my knowledge and certificate, so how do I grow from point A to B? So I think this is something that we really need to think about, increased capacity building and trainings. And I want to appreciate um, forecasting institutions such as Aga Khan University because they were able to begin uh, midwifery at bachelor's level pretty fast and also advanced professional midwife. And I believe they will go ahead also to uh, start the midwifery PhDs. And of course, there are many other universities within the country that can do this. And I believe I'm challenging this, all the educators to be able to improve or give opportunities for growth. And this means midwives are going to see the fruit of their education. So if I go to school, then I should be able to see my fruits or the fruits of my efforts. So I think professional development and leadership is something that the midwives really need. Then respect, dignity, and non-discrimination, 5% of you 
um, said they would like to be treated with respect by other staff members and especially our colleagues, the doctors. And I, I believe this one cannot be, you know, underscored because I, midwives do a lot of work, but when it comes to things like MPDSR, you find midwives being victimized, sometimes for errors that could have been avoided if our colleagues were available. So I think this calls for even more empowerment of midwives that you can be able to stand for yourself and talk and also protect your professional standing. Then midwives, 3% of midwives requested that they require power, autonomy, and improved gender norms and policies. And I believe this is going to be assisted, especially I've seen Professor Eunice Dirango being the chair of one of the bodies. So I believe he, uh, she'll be able to speak a bit about uh, how to empower us when it comes to gender norms and policies within uh, different uh, capacities. And of course, autonomy is something that we keep on talking about that midwives, are independent professionals. And for sure, we need to be respected as such and be able to stand and also protect this profession. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think we'll be engaging further. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much, Inis, for uh, presenting for us the top findings. Um, could you go back to the slide that Inis was presenting? Um, just the slide before, yeah, there we go. Thank you so much, Inis, for, for presenting uh, this top line findings that we got from the listening exercise. These findings, um, I'm sure for most of those who are in this forum today, especially the midwives, are not new to most of you. Um, and also in terms of the evidence, it is not new evidence. We have actually tremendous evidence that has been collected um, beyond Kenya, from Kenya and beyond, around um, the plight of the midwife, if you, are, if you allow me to say that. Um, and so this is just a validation of what we've been hearing. This is not the first listening exercise. We actually did one last year um, in the Lakeside region where we talked to midwives. We had conversations with midwives in Vihiga, Kakamega, and Kisumu. And even then, these are the same things that showed up um, during that listening exercise, including what came out in the state of the midwifery report um, last year during the International Day of the Midwife. And so now is the time to build that momentum. Now is, the evidence is there. Now it is time to act on the evidence that has come, has been brought uh, before us. And like uh, uh, the previous speakers have said, there's need for that multi-sector collaboration and, and, and looking for those opportunities to really hinge the midwifery advocacy. We'll be taking um, a slight uh, reflection break uh, to allow the participants on the call, on the uh, on the on the on in this meeting to um, react to ask a question uh, from what has been presented by Eunice and from uh, Eunice at Sally and Professor Eunice Dirangu. Um, but then also I'd like to say because we will have another session after this, which will be more um, interactive for the question and answer. We'll only be collecting um, one or two questions. The rest can use the chat box where my colleagues will be picking some of these questions that will be asked, even as the other speakers speak um, on the different aspects showed up in the, in the survey. So if there are any questions that, um, or any reflections that you have from the very nice national contextual uh, framing that Professor Durango uh, offered, or from the findings that Eunice has just um, delivered. Let me know. You can raise your hand or use the chat box uh, function. Can you let me know if there's a question? And please also, um, for those who have joined the call when we had started, please introduce yourself on the chat as well. 
with your name, where you're from, um, in terms of the county, and maybe you can introduce if you're from an institution or you're a midwife yourself, please let us know so that we can identify you. Any questions and reflections before we move to the next session? I don't see any on the chat. Um, I do not see any hands raised. Oh, I see a hundred. Sunny Baraza, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for that presentation from the panelists. Uh, the findings are pretty interesting. And as you say, some of these uh, findings are issues I think we are grappling with already, uh, such as uh, inadequate supplies and all that. But my question is uh, more or less about uh, the current state of affairs in terms of the uh, motivation that uh, health work, not, not just the midwives, but the health workers generally are receiving uh, you know, from devolved units. Um, maybe I, I, I'm just wondering, could that be one of the factors that may be hindering people from uh, uh, maybe nurses or midwives to specialize in the midwifery, midwifery specialization? Uh, because uh, the presenter from Aga Khan University, Professor Yunis, I think mentioned, they can hardly fill up a class. Is it that, is, is it that uh, prospective midwifery uh, students are demotivated about the state of affairs? Uh, you know, you go to a county hostel, perhaps you are sent to work in outpatient department, you're sent to pediatrics, yet you have a specialization in a certain field. I don't know what are your comments on that. Uh, Professor Ndurango, you may you may respond. Sure, happy to. Do you mind taking down the slides so that I can see the person asking the question a little bit better? Um, <laughs> thank you. That's that's perfect. So yeah, Sami. So Sami, you you you've hit the nail on the head, and it's not just about the midwifery uh, training; it's actually about all specialist training. And the only and that's why I always say you you it's important to think about what's the root solution to the problem the root solution to that problem lies in two areas we needed a nursing and midwifery policy and allow me to use both nursing and midwifery policy because in the country we don't have distinct uh, policy uh, oversight for the two they are all seen as together but we use both the term nursing and midwifery policy so one we needed the nursing and midwifery policy because we needed to be very clear what are the key elements that require focus and i listed the, the eight of them which very much ma very much match um the status of of midwifery reports by w by who and icm the second element is actually the scheme in uh, looking at the scheme the current scheme what the current scheme has done is you you grow your career grows up to a certain point uh to go beyond that point you have to move to leadership isn't it you have to move to leadership yeah. because if you if you're still in practice there's no progress for you so the thinking behind what we are trying to do the, the scheme is still under review we are hoping to be able to complete this we're hoping to complete before <laughs> the elections but let's see what happens um is we now looking at two arms so that even if I remain in clinical practice as a midwife, at least we do in this case, because that's what we're discussing, I should be able to grow in my career in practice, just the same way I would grow if I had moved to leadership. Because then if you don't have that, we are by and large saying, that we once people grow in their career, the only way they can go forward is if we move them from practice and then we put them into leadership. That has several problems. One, it is very demotivating for people to remain in, in practice. Secondly, it also means that if you're talking about universal health coverage and you want your best, your best placed where it matters, in the primary setting or in the clinical setting, then it becomes an impossibility because then they'll have gone anyway to other yeah. areas. So for me, that is where the solution needs to come from. So when we did the policy, we had very, very good support from COG. Remember when I said earlier about convening everybody in one space so that everybody is supportive of your initiative that is what also needs to happen so the scheme of service also we have a representation from uh, cog we have a representation from mac as Eunice has indicated but we also have a uh, representation from lstm lstm i think has been doing a lot of work 
Liverpool School yeah. of Tropical Medicine has been doing a lot of yeah. work around the drift. They are also sitting in the TWG, yeah, among the other association and other key players. So um, for me, my comment would be, yes, you're spot on. There's things to do, but I think the question is to start at the root cause. Because then if we have a policy then that is distinguishing a person who has done a higher diploma in midwifery, for example, or a bachelor's in midwifery, or a master's in midwifery going upwards, then it means we start then, we, you, if you have a scheme, then you can compel the, and I know this is a biggest challenge for those in the counties, then you can start to think about how do you compel the counties around uh, leveraging on this. But I'll throw the challenge back at you. A lot of the counties have, who as bosses? They have nurses and midwives as bosses. So what role do they also play in pushing and advocating for your agenda? So. Mm. I always say multi-pronged approach. It's not about the person at the top looking, you looking up to the person at the top and asking what they are doing. And then we come to you, as we did with the nursing policy, to the majority of people for input and feedback. Please contribute because your feedback helps in terms of coming up with a document that actually speaks to the realities of what you're facing on a daily basis. It is not a 100% solution to the problem, but I think it steps us up in the right direction in terms of solving the problems. I hope I've tried to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Sorry. much. Um, yeah, and we have a reflection from Christine Mutteri on the chat box who says, many wish to advance or specialize, but cost is too high. And like mentioned, no recognition in most devolved units. So I guess that speaks to what you're saying, uh, Professor Ndirango. Yeah. Yeah, one yeah, yeah, so Sorry. the first part speaks to that, yeah. The second part also, now if I wear my other hat, like at Agakan, we do have scholarships and sponsorships for various training. So if one applies for the programs, they can apply for the scholarships and get the support needed. Of course, the scholarships are not many, they are few, but they do serve a purpose, especially where there's, a, there's an increased gap. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you so much. So now let us move to the next session. I think we're good with time uh, to dive deeper into those top asks that showed up um, in the listening exercise. I will ask my colleague to uh, put back the slide. All right, and I will now at this juncture um, invite our third speaker, who is um, from Makweni County. Uh, this is Ms. Kristin Mwendi, who is currently the unit head for reproductive, maternal, newborn, and health services. And she's going to speak to us about this um, uh, first ask, the top ask that showed up in, in our listening exercise. Uh, and, and she'll tell us at the, at the end of the day, um, Christine, the midwives are asking that the supplies for them to actually deliver in their role, that the infrastructure around the work, the, the environment in which they work is not enabling, and enabling in terms of actually the, the hardware, right, the supplies and the equipment. And so from your experience in Makweni County, can you give us insights on what, if, what, what needs to be done to ensure that facilities, especially at you know, level one, level two, level three, four, five uh, facilities at the county level are well resourced, you know, the supplies, the needed supplies and equipment that the midwives have told us. And also what steps need to be taken? Because I think Makweni has really, um, it's, it's, it's a trailblazer in a lot of health, um, health developments uh, in the country. So from your experience, what needs to be done to ensure that these working conditions at the facility level are improved? Uh, Christine, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Sandra, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as it has been said, my name is Christine Moindi. I coordinate reproductive health services at the county, Makueni. So I agree with the finding. The physical environment, it's the number one motivator for any service. So if the physical environment is not enabling, the services will not be done. However, whatever, how much, whatever the, the staff is paid, if the physical environment is not enabling, the services will not be done. And when you are talking about the physical environment, we mean that the infrastructure, starting with the infection prevention and control infrastructure, you need running water in the facilities, you need PPEs, in the facilities, you need to have proper waste collection and disposal 
for the for the midwives to work and you also need adequate space in for to support labor and delivery and also postnatal because we always talk about having privacy in the wards, privacy in the labor ward, privacy postnatally. And that's really what's lacked in most of the facilities. We also talk about having birth companions. Do our facilities allow for that? The physical space, does it allow for that? And the physical space, does it also allow for the birth position of choice for the, for the clients? So we, those are the things that are needed in terms of the infrastructure. When you come to the equipment, the delivery bed, of course we have some facilities having coaches as delivery beds. And you, you, a delivery bed has to be so ideal that it can be adjusted to the height of the service provider and also to allow for the physically, the challenged clients to be able to ha be handled with dignity. So. Some, some of those items are what it's really needed and the midwives were correct to say that that affects their services. Also the delivery set, we know that in most facilities you will find a delivery set that has two or three equipment. They only have a standard delivery set where they are maybe assessed, students are being assessed. That's the time you find the standard delivery pack available. Now when you come to the supplies, you need the essential medicines and medical supplies that are needed to support a delivery. It's what really matters most. Because you might tell a nurse midwife to support a delivery, there are no gloves. How are they going to do it? They cannot access oxytocin in case of any emergency. What is going to happen? We don't have the gynecological gloves. How are you going to remove a retained placenta? So those supplies are really what is needed. And the midwives are correct to say that that affects their work. And what are counties doing? Makwene County, I can say we are not yet there, but we have, we have really done something. I can commend our county government for doing something in terms of the physical space that has, in, it, it, has it has been modified in most of the facilities. For example, in our the county referral hospital, the space was increased, I think, to a hundredfold. The mother and child hospital that has enough physical space even to allow for a bad companion with privacy. That one has been done, especially for the county referral hospital. And also the other health centers we've had, the maternity units build to support the, 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 the structures were already existing. So we can say that and it has, it has allowed us to increase our deliveries. Currently, as we speak, our stillbirth attenders is around 90% from as low as 33% before devolution. So we can say the physical infrastructure development, they have helped to improve that. The only problem that now affects the, the delivery sometimes is the supplies especially in the lower level facilities that are not able to generate enough income to, to, to get their own supplies. And when I'm talking about supplies, I'm talking about the PPs, the gloves, I'm talking about the essential drugs that are needed. Sometimes you find that they are not enough. And so a midwife will admit a client, monitor to a certain extent, and then they have to refer to the next level. That one hinders that. So what can we do about this? I believe the game changer was the insurance to mothers, the Linda Mama, and midwives should be given a voice so that they can be able to actually administer that the funds that we get from Linda Mama. If we are able to be able to, to sit down and budget for those funds to support the maternity services. I believe most of this infrastructure needs, the supplies, will be taken care of. And in some facilities, the midwives have a voice. We, we have some level four facilities that the, mid, the midwife drives what is to be bought using the Linda Mama. And we have seen some facilities like uh, one of the sub-county hospitals, they procured an ultrasound machine using the Linda Mama. So we can actually use the funds that are available if well applied they can address some of these issues.
And when these issues are addressed, most of the midwives issues will be addressed because that was the number one issue that they identified, the physical in infrastructure and the supplies. So from a county perspective, I think something can be done because the, if, if the insurance continues, the mothers, if the, the costs, the, the costs for the services is removed. And then the mothers are the, that those funds are, are able to be utilized fully. We can be able to achieve some of the things that the midwives want. So I think from those few remarks, that's the, what I can say about supplies and physical environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and I, I, allow me as, to, to evoke the powers I have as a moderator to just quickly throw a question back at you um, around, um, you know, you're, you're talking about the, you know, if, if funds are available, um, you know, things will move, but that works in a perfect world, right? Um, right now, I think uh, from, the mid, from the conversations that we had with midwives around this issue, they felt that there was a gap between the communication between um, um, where, they, where they are in the health facility and the county, and especially around resourcing and budgeting, they felt quite invisible. Maybe you can speak to that, uh, given that maybe perhaps they, they interact with your unit uh, often, um, and maybe give us some insight into what bottlenecks are there and what can be done to ensure that that communication is there. And because they, 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 they feel like they're, they're invisible in that space, um, and then especially when it comes to not even prioritizing resourcing for midwifery or resourcing for equipment that are geared towards maternal reproductive health. What, what, what how do you address those bottlenecks that we, we've talked about? Like I, I've said, midwifery oh. is one of the resourced areas and we have the Linda Mama and the NHIF and the facilities that are able to utilize it fully, we have seen some results. Like, I, like in level two and three, we have some facilities who have the midwife as the AIE holder. So they can be able to prioritize the needs that they have. In other facilities, there needs to be collaborative like agreement between the in charge in most places will be the clinical officer and the midwife. And in Makweni, the facilities that work, that have, relationship. Some health centers I can mention, they have been able to utilize the funds well so that they can support the midwifery, the, the delivery services in, the, in their facilities. In the level four facilities, we have seen the, the nurses or the midwives are part of the decision-making organ. We see the, the, the executive expenditure committee. The nurse is usually one of the the, among the three, we have the med soup, the, the, HA, the HAO, and the, the nursing officer in charge. Where we have a strong midwife as a nursing officer in charge, we have found that the, the resources are used well. And we have examples in the, in the county where we have a strong nursing officer who is also a midwife. We have seen it work well. The problem now comes in when you have a nursing officer who has no touch with midwifery. So the prioritization, the, the, when the funds come, the, the maternity is not prioritized. You can find that that is what is used to pay the cash flows or it's used to pay the electricity bills. Of course, they support the, the maternity services, but not to a large extent. So we need leadership in the facilities to be able to utilize those funds well. And, and I believe when the deliveries increase, also the funds increase. So that is the tech where we have strong leadership among the nursing cadre. You have the funds are being utilized well, and uh, of course resources are limited. If if you don't prioritize the issues, they are not going to be to be taken. So the nurse midwife or the nursing officer in charge really has to be on the forefront, advocating for the needs of the midwives in terms of the supplies, especially, and the physical infrastructure. Yes. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine. That was actually quite insightful. 
Uh, so we'll move over to the next speaker who will be giving us insights on the second and third ask. Um, so Ms. Edna Salam uh, is the current CEO, uh, registrar of the Nursing Council of Kenya. Uh, she, she's a, sorry, she's the registrar and chief executive officer of the Nursing Council of Kenya. Um, she has experience, she's a national leader with experience in transforming Kenya's health system through regulation of nursing education and practice and is keen on developing and implementing, implementing national policies. She holds a master's degree in public health and bachelor of science in nursing and a fellow of Afyabora Global Health Leadership Program, Global Nursing Leadership Institute, and a certified global health consultant. Uh, Ms. Ms. Edna Talam will be telling us about the opportunities that are there to improve professional development and leadership for midwives in Kenya and comment on the need for increased motivation and recognition of midwives' um, role in the profession. Welcome, Edna. Uh, thank you so, so much, uh, Sandra, and uh, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Just want to applaud uh, our previous speakers uh, who came uh, before me and um, Professor Dirangu, we've had Christine and also Eunice Atsali, who has given us a bit of insight. So I think my work, uh, Sandra and team, <clears throat> is basically to uh, have um, to, to just uh, talk less because a lot of things has been spoken up and also wait for an opportunity for our colleagues to be able to make reflections of our today's presentation. So <clears throat> in regards to uh, what I'll, I'll be speaking for, uh, I just want to basically be able to highlight uh, three, four items. The first one is the scope of practice. Uh, the second one is uh, professional development, uh, leadership, and uh, finally the opportunities that um, we basically have. So in regards to that, I don't know if you can be able to, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, just uh, pulling that as um, slide down. So uh, in regards of the scope of practice, I just want to really, really, really appreciate uh, all our colleagues are present in this call because I can actually be able to uh, uh, even uh, point out a few of our colleagues who are in this call that they've supported the Nazi Castle of Kenya uh, through the nominations by their respective associations, more so Midwife Association of Kenya, in the development of scopes of practice for various uh, specialists. First, uh, we did the nurses and midwife, which we launched last year in 2021. And the current one that we just launched uh, a month ago was the APM as uh, scope of practice, I think within this month of May. And uh, we are working to be able to finalize other the subspecialties within nursing and midwifery. So the scope of practice has actually provided um, the midwives uh, in regards of the autonomy to practice as the midwives themselves. It actually provides uh, what what the midwife is practiced according to their competencies and what they learned. And this uh, is able to also uh, help them through to ensure that um, we also utilize their potentials, which, call, which, which at the moment may have been inhibited because of lack of that scope of practice. And this has been a big advocacy. And I do remember that uh, one of those people that allowed me not to mention, uh, they had a discussion um, between the midwives, the, the gynecologists and the, and the obstetrician and the other specialization within the healthcare professionals. And they weren't quite sure what is really the role of the midwives. And I think when I was called, I just told them it is within our scope of practice. And the discussion ended because then the regulator had enabled them to be able to practice that. So the scope of practice really has, uh, uh, gives a, a very good guidance in that. Just allow me to quickly just mention a quick uh, thematic areas uh, which have been pointed out by the, our scope of practice that uh, it was just launched uh, for advanced practice uh, midwife. And uh, the advanced practice uh, midwife, uh, the mid midwife practitioner um, in within that context provides uh, four elements on in regards of the scope. So first, it actually provides um, the applicability in regards of what is it that they should. So within the direct clinical and community practice, it's actually defined what the midwife will be able to perform within the education, within the research and evidence-based practice, and again, our guidance in the clinical leadership and collaborative practice uh, that the midwife should be able to work within that APM scope. And this actually provides that conversation. So moving on uh, to the 
continuous professional development, I just want to point out that um, uh, Unisa Sally and the team, as you are aware, we started the conversation with the World Continuous uh, Education Alliance with the LSTM team to map the competencies that are priority for the midwives now, so that we can be able to develop CPD specific uh, for the midwives, so that when you log in into our platform, you are able to quickly go and pick uh, the CPD programs within that. But again, as you are aware, again, we also don't work alone. Uh, NCK just provide a platform, but we have various CPD providers. And of course, I wish to also to acknowledge LSTM, j and j and also other partners that they've been able to provide our courses just like KMOC, BMOC, which has enhanced the midwives and also going even beyond to support the Nazi Castle of Kenya to review the curriculum for the Bachelor of Science in Midwifery, as Eunice said earlier mentioned that they've mounted that and also other universities. So, so far we are working with five universities that they need to uh, finalize and uh, mount and implement the Bachelor of Science in Midwifery Direct Program. And I did not want to also speak more by my previous speakers and also underscore the need that we need to be able to ensure that we have midwife and we have the midwifery educations, which meet the international standards of midwifery, which has been established. So within that CPD, again, I've spoken about the partnership, I've spoken about the mapping of the competencies, and also the need for us to be able to work that. But by and large, uh, we need also to also advocate and have more partnership to be able to support this. But I also want also to also note that professional development, again, that's not, is not only tied to the CPDs, but more of a uh, continuous clinical teaching and learning. Because teaching and learning actually happens within our setups, whether you are a student or not a student, and the provisions for that learning should be provided by that environment that I do not want to just also be able to point it out further that uh, Professor Nirang had pointed in, 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 in her remarks earlier. So uh, that actually builds on that. And uh, what, again, we are also working with and again, a bit of discussion because um, our entry point in the midwifery is also more so within our association mark, uh, where we need to ensure that um, we have the we 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 able to have the complementary courses that we can even share with uh, the other health, with the, the skilled path personnel, which is either a clinical officer, a doctor, a midwife, or also a nurse midwife. So with that, um, we should be able to provide that opportunities for learning. And it's something that we need to be able to do that. Of course, the trick is that beyond what we can get online, we also need also to be able to have enhanced um, competency and, uh, enhancements like HEMO. And this, we are actually having a call with other partners to see how they can be able to put that. But within also the Ministry of Health agenda, it's also part within our reproductive uh, health uh, department, which they are actually championing all this. So this conversation is going on. And I'll say that Midwifery has gotten the political win of the nation. You saw from the events that the first lady has been able to mount. And you are within uh, the hearts of, uh, you know, uh, Excellency. Uh, the first lady of the Republic of Kenya. And also it actually brings a lot of attractions in regards of the support and a, a bit of uh, more of the donors and partners to support this process. So going back to the leadership and how this is done, just to quickly point out and add what my colleagues have said it again, we have the nurses and midwives uh, alliance as soon as I've mentioned, and we also have the quad. Quad means that uh, the regulator, the, our associations, both nurses and midwives, the educators, and also the Minister of Health, we've come together. We have our sort of a vision board on how we need to be able to strengthen it because we just want to build the synergies and we want all of us to advocate of who a midwife is. So even though, I have a nursing bias background. I should be able to advocate and also support the midwifery professions as we do that. But again, uh, within the education, which I do not want to mention, what we also have in the pipeline is that, yes, we have the midwife, we have the nurse midwife, but we just say that we will be able to incorporate us. But what are the competencies that our nurse midwives are lacking and how we need to be able to enhance those competencies, either through uh, the in-service training or either through the CPD and the other professional development so that they are not left behind in regards of uh, enhancing them. Because at the moment, they really still serve us as we have this pipeline of trained midwives, which will be able to support and build a big workforce for the future. So within the leadership, again, uh, as, as you are aware, any midwife is a leader, you need to uh, say that. But again, when we also say leadership, leadership actually starts from the point of care services. As you are frontline midwife, when a mother comes to you, the leadership will start from there. So I find that each and every midwife should be able to have leadership skills. 
the only uh, segregation is that what are your jobs at that particular time? What should be your job description at that? Say that um, they are geared towards the midwife and also the nurses. Uh, to be able to also enhance their leadership skills because you need the leadership skills for you to build your confidence uh, for, for what you are able to lead. And this then goes by and by, as Christine has mentioned, that if you are leading, if you are in maternity or leading any RH uh, program and you do not have passion in midwifery, you may not really need to, you may not advocate for what midwives want and what the resources needs to be. So part of the advocacy that we'll do from all the quad members is to ensure that uh, we need to be able to place people in our leadership position, whether you are a unit in charge, whether you are a maternity in charge, a clinic in charge, so far as we are offering the services for reproductive, maternal, neonatal, and child health services should be supported by someone who has a bias uh, in this particular field to be able to support that leadership. But again, uh, again, building on that, uh, it's also supported by that scope of practice because it's also clearly also stipulates the leadership that uh, each and every uh, midwives, depending on their level of training, should be able to work on. And uh, uh, what also Eunice also pointed out in the nurses and midwives policy, we have a uh, clear policies directing our strategies for to enhance the leadership and governance structures for both nurses and midwifery profession. Uh, and also, uh, finally, within that um, leadership is again to advocate uh, for more opportunities for nurses to train as leaders and also to practice as leaders because we also need that experience. And this will be supported by career progressions. And once we align ourselves with these career progression guidelines, which formerly we used to call the scheme of service, we also need also to lobby as a profession and talk with one voice with salaries and remuneration commission say that uh, we have our midwives to be remunerated according to their level of training, their experience, and also putting in mind the autonomy of the practice that they need to be able to have for us to support them. I don't want to mention other things that Christine has pointed out in regards of how do we support? How do we ensure resources are available? How do we negotiate uh, with the government? I think uh, that one she pointed out quite clear on how we need to do that. And finally, opportunities are just wind up. Uh, my comment is that uh, these opportunities that we have at the moment, uh, the Nancy Castle of Kenya are trying to finalize uh, uh, specialist guidelines, say that uh, the midwives are, are, are put within the specialist registers. And this will be able to give you a license for you to now advocate for more um, remuneration and also the deployment according to your specialization. That's the work you should be able to work on. And I just want to really appreciate um, the council members of the leadership of Professor Dirangu for ensuring that uh, within the three years, we can actually be able to see the many scopes of practice we provided the guidelines, the policies, and also things that we push that our profession at lack and other professional are actually learning from us as we move on. Uh, the other one is again, uh, the council again is, uh, is also in the process and we hope that we finalize soon the regulations for a midwives to be able to be given the power and autonomy to operate a nursing home and offer midwifery services where we want our midwives to be able to have that continuum of care from antenatal to uh, from pre-pregnancy to antenatal to labor and birth and ongoing care of the woman and the baby. So that is what we'll be able to package on what should constitute a, mid a midwifery home that it offers um, um, some midwifery services, midwifery led services. And again, again, uh, we also are providing also provision as you are aware to open a clinic for you to be able to provide midwifery led services, which are other opportunities for entrepreneurship. We should be able to argument uh, what uh, perhaps uh, we are not able to get within the government or, or rather that we do not consider as, um, as, as good remuneration packages that we get at the moment. And uh, we, 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 we have much that we can push, but again, within our country also have the limitations that um, Per se, we might not be able to uh, work on it now, but we need to be able to pick up that conversation with the leadership of uh, within the country. And uh, finally, is that uh, midwives again have also opportunities for offer community midwifery services, and we will be able to have another forum uh, units with the membership of the MAC so that uh, we can take to them 
the, the, the processes of application and ensuring that um, they, they, we provide them to the licenses for their midwifery-led clinics, for their, for their midwifery services, and also to ensure that they are registered as a specialist mid, midwives. I think for me, Sandra, for now, let me pause. I think it will be a, a good opportunity for me to hear the midwives' voices present here and also for them to make the reflections and anything that they wish to clarify, happy to be able to support this. So to just see finalize, I am really proud of all of you, proud actually to also be a nurse midwife and to have biased in midwifery and also appreciate the fact that I had an opportunity in my early mm -hmm. career to work in maternity and I can be able to hear and feel you because I'm able to reflect on what it is within the practice area. I uh, thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much, Edna. That was a, a comprehensive breakdown of some of the developments that have happened. Um, I, I, I think we, we are moving in the right direction because I know from the conversations that we've had with midwives, that recognition, recognition has been so key. Um, so key in the sense that they feel you know, it has demotivated them in practice across different areas from the education, from the practice, um, but more so even just their voice as health workers. And so from what you've submitted today, I think um, it gives us a good um, direction and pathway to follow in terms of following up. I think our, our biggest call is that even as this, and you've mentioned the stakeholders, the, multi, the many stakeholders that, that are involved in this conversation is that the midwives are there. You know, not just those in the top leadership that you're actually evoking and, 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 and engaging the midwives in Kenya at large in the, all the diversity in their different spaces. But I know that is something in plan because it seems like it's a recent and, and ongoing developments. So thank you for that. Um, and again, in the spirit of the voice of the midwife, we are going to circle back to the midwife um, uh, to tell us the, the, the call of action that has shown up in the findings, the top advocacy asks around supplies and resourcing, around professional development, around improved working conditions um, and career progression. What will it mean for us to actually respond to this ask? Because that is what we do. Uh, this is a feedback loop that we are talking about. When you speak now, we need to act. The decision makers need to act. So what does it mean for the decision makers uh, to act? What does it mean to, uh, to the midwives? And so I will invite um, Eunice to come back again uh, to speak from the lens of the midwife and, and, and tell us what does responding to this call for midwifery investments mean to the midwife? Uh, thank you so much, Sandra, and uh, the team that has just presented before me. Uh, first of all, I want to give apology. My colleague was supposed to speak, but uh, has been caught up with some other issues. And I want to also give apology on behalf of our chair, Tekla. Um, she's been caught up also with uh, some issues, but she's together with us and we are taking notes for her. So um, one of the things that uh, we are taking home today, actually, uh, regarding supplies and functional facilities, Midwives are requesting for spaces that are uh, functional. And I like what um, the lady from Makueni, uh, her presentation about the space. So while we, are, we need maternity units, but we need a space that is functional enough to be able to support our women in a more empowering manner. So for example, right now we are speaking about uh, family care. We are speaking about male involvement. So how do we sit on the table so that we are able to facilitate birthing units that can actually accommodate our fathers and our partners and even mother-in-law. So I think one of the things that we really need to fight for as midwives wherever in our small corners is to be in the planning of even our facilities. So when the planning is being done, where is the midwife? You are planning for a labor ward without a midwife. So how will it be function? How will it function? Because I've gone to many maternity units where the spaces are made as though it's a hotel. Well, that can be okay, but then this is a labor unit. So I think one of the things we need to uh, think about is 
we need to campaign so that we are in that planning. When the engineers are creating maternity unit plans, our midwives need to be on the table. And regarding supplies, I think I can't overemphasize enough that our midwives need to be in the budgeting, uh, budgeting committees so that when budgets are done and expenditures are done, our midwives are supposed to be there so that they can prioritize what is required in our labor suits. You go in many labor suits and you find a lot of uh, the long gloves. When in, in real sense, they are lacking the normal surgical gloves or even clean gloves to use. So I think if a midwife was at the budget center, then priorities would be made better for the midwife. Uh, the other aspect I think we spoke about is uh, professional development and leadership. And we spoke about uh, midwives being uh, budgeted for. I think the counties, if we have any directors of nursing services or CNOs within this platform, we need to think about how we are going to budget for professional development of our midwives. If we remunerate them well, they can be able to take up studies seriously for themselves. But at the end of the day, we need to budget at least to support midwives, especially to advance their midwifery skills. Um, respect and dignity and non-discriminatory um, events. I think um, this is something that has actually been, you know, it's been on over, over time, but then we need to think about how do we create this respect? And I think it's a high time we started engaging on us on the same platform with our colleagues so that they can recognize the work we do and be able to engage helpfully, you know, quality engagements with our colleagues so that they can also respect us. So as midwives, I think out there, let us improve our dignity as we engage with our, uh, our colleague, the doctors. And of course, be able to uh, bring them in some of our even conferences, even workshops, when we do workshops, let us engage the doctors. So I think we need to create environment where we are engaging more with the doctors and obstetricians. I want to appreciate the, the CEO of Nursing Council for talking about something that is quite crucial in our profession, the license. I've done my Bachelor of Science in midwifery. I've, spoken, I've been taught about midwifery-led care. I can actually run a midwifery-led unit. But then at the end of the day, the policies and the licenses are quite expensive. So I would like to request the CEO to review even the cost of license for the midwife. So that when a midwife wants to open a maternity unit, when we assess that the environment is empowering for the woman and of course that particular midwife, then we need to give them reasonable prices so that our midwives can be able to provide quality maternal care in a more reasonable way. And then of course, uh, we need to reconsider also um, the licensure so that it's not just a clinic for the midwife, mm -hmm. but uh, maternity homes. So I would like to see many midwives doing midwifery practice and not just maternity homes, but also situations where I can be able to work at a Gakan hospital or Mata hospital and do my consultancy as a midwife. So I think those are some of the things we need to push now in this country so that the normal woman, normal physiological birth is done by the midwife and not by a doctor. So I think it's a high time we really, really amplified our voices as midwives in our small corners, wherever we are, so that we are able to be heard and also provide quality care so that at least we can also be, you know, respected and also trusted with the care we are giving. Um, I would like to request this. I don't know whether this is the right forum, but I think I'll just speak about it because I know uh, um, Professor Eunice Ndirangu and uh, Edna, they engage a lot with the directorate. So one of the things I would like to request is the naming. So while midwives have requested that they want 
midwifery to be prioritized in the budget. That can only be done when we have nurse, director of nursing and midwifery. And at the helm of leadership, we have a director of nursing and midwifery. In every county, we need to have a director of nursing and midwifery, and of course have um, now the other, you know, county midwife officer and county nursing officer. So that when these people are at the helm of the budget, they will be able to remember that they are midwives. But if I'm being called director of nursing services, there's a high likelihood I may not advocate more for the midwives. So I think we are doing quite a lot and I think we've started well. In, in fact, what I'm liking is people are able now to differentiate that I'm either a nurse or a midwife, depending on where you, your interest lies. So that is a starting point, but I know so much will need to be put so that at least we are able to be seen, to be heard, to be trusted with the women that we take care of. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you, um, and oops, there we go. Thank you so much, Inis. That was a very powerful call to action. Um, I'll ask my colleague to pull the last slide. And 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 this we are now we are now um, finishing, and and we want to finish powerfully. Will we honor their voices? Will we honor their needs? Will we honor their ideas? Will we also listen and act? for the midwives before they disappear, because you've heard that there's a shortage and people are now moving to other things. And so as we, as we wrap up, I'd like to ask the participants and even the panelists, who are, um, the, the, the panelists who have been facilitating the round table, do you have any reflections, any questions that you want to add uh, to what has already been said or you want to ask to the, the, the different panelists, this is the time to do that so that we know how to take this conversation forward because this is supposed to be an action meeting from this then move to the next step. So do we have any questions um, that are directed to the speakers or just to the forum? I'll also just note that um, Ms. Edna Talam will meet, who is about to leave. So if you have any questions um, that are related to what she had talked about, the professional development in leadership, uh, kindly bring those for those questions and insights forward first. Someone is trying to speak. I, I see Collins Masinde, your hand is up. Uh, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, Sandra. Sorry for uh, joining the meeting very late, but I'm very, very happy uh, for the kind of, kind of conversation that I've done today. Uh, Briefly, uh, I want to say that I was part of the team that was collecting this kind of data and whatever that has been said, whatever that has been shared today, it just needs actions because without actions, all the history we are giving is not going to yield fruits. But for sure, if there is need or there is that urgency for us to improve the services delivery in the hospitals as we, we are looking forward to do that. There is a lot of investment in terms of, we need to do investment in terms of capacity building and also career upgrading in like, like what you say, like uh, nurses are upgrading and other things. So that was just my uh, simple suggestion, right? This kind of conversation is in a, an eye opener for us advocates to go at least push for this kind of change in our capacities. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Collins. Indeed, it is a it is a motivation for us to actually um, rally together, as has been said by the different speakers. Um, do we have any other reflection? Also, Professor Eunice and Jirango would will be leaving soon. Uh, do we have any questions that are directed to the council or to the policy makers? Um, I see. So there's Angela Wanjala and then Sami Baraza. So Angela Wanjala, you have the floor. Hello. Can Hello. Anyone hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Hello.
Sandra, I think we are having a challenge with Angela. So maybe Sami can speak as she sorts herself. Hear me? Sami, go ahead. As Angela, we are having a problem with your um, hearing you. And maybe you can leave your submissions on the chat box as we try and uh, reconnect. But Sami, as you do that, Sami can, uh, can speak. Go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, mine is just a comment uh, and a rather a word of uh, appreciation also. Uh, first is to the nursing council. I think we have seen a great transformation in the recent past as far as uh, the development of uh, healthcare providers is concerned, that is uh, nurses and midwives. I think the council has really played a great role. I have, uh, uh, being an educator myself, uh, I've seen great transformation in terms of even the materials we are using these days, in terms of uh, you know, the logbooks the students are using, the manuals. So I, I really want to give it up to the council, uh, the top leadership led by uh, Edna Talam. Uh, I think keep it up, we are headed in the right direction. This discourse is important. And uh, Sandra, I think we have worked together many times in this uh, collecting all this data and seeing these results encourages me because we have uh, the decision makers with us here. And I think uh, what matters a lot is also to, to put it forth to the, to the other decision makers, stakeholders, uh, particularly you know, gaining political will. For some of these issues, really we may have very good technical uh, recommendations, but without good political will, Make of midwives, and I want to appreciate the White Ribbon Alliance for the great work you're doing. For Aga Khan University, I think I'm impressed with the idea of having a specializations as, as early as from a bachelor's level for midwifery. Uh, for a long time, we, uh, you know, you do a master's, for example, in MSN with the specialty, you hardly go back to the clinical area. All you think of is going to teach or rather go to other leadership and technical positions. So I think uh, this discourse of having uh, both in practice as leadership and academia is important so that at a very early stage, the young, we have a number of students here, some of them are my students, and uh, from a young age, people need, uh, I think they need to start, you know, having ideas, where do I want to go? Um, uh, can I go and be an educator? Can I practice my midwifery so well that I can have a PhD and yet still being in the clinical area. And that is something we still, we, we need to keep on discussing. So thank you very much. It's been enjoyable to listen to you. Thank you so much, Sami. That was a good comment. Excuse me, I need to cough. <coughs> Atina Hand from Maureen Daniel, you have the floor. Hi, team. Sorry, actually, I have nothing to say other than just to say I'm sorry. I came in a bit late. I'm one person who was very much willing to attend this meeting. Unfortunately, because of competing tasks in our government institutions, I was not able to. So I'm very sorry, Angela and team, but I'm here with you. I'm really following it. Congratulations to all. Thank you, Maureen. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, do we have any last reflections? All right, I will allow the panelists to give their closing remarks or call to action. We can start with you, Eunice, uh, Professor Eunice Terango, please. Thanks, thanks very much. Sandra, just call me Eunice. Um, I will not repeat what I had uh, said earlier on my call to action, just remind people that we all need to convene together so that we have concerted efforts as opposed to um, different um, people doing little things separately. That would be my first one. Um, my second call to action is to remember that each of us has a role to play in making things happen. We determine the kind of uh, response we get from the public about the profession. 
if as midwives we are able to set ourselves apart as those individuals who provide reproductive, maternal, newborn care in a manner that is acceptable and respectful, then we become the go-to person and the go-to choice that people are not complaining, do you know midwife A, how horrible they are? That already creates value. So when you talk about uh, running clinics or midwifery-led services, it becomes the obvious and automatic choice. And I think we've seen examples of those who work very well uh, in developed countries, so they obviously need to work here as well. My third point um, is related to something Sami said about political will. We as a profession determine how those uh, people in leadership uh, respond to us as a profession. Sometimes we get stuck in believing that we can only push for things if we are very loud and we are screaming and we are fighting. Yes, there's space and room for that, but by and large, a lot of effort is a, a lot of efforts need to go to leveraging those relationships, but most importantly, allowing people to understand what the profession is about. And to be honest, I'm extremely honored and proud as chair of Nursing Council of Kenya, but also at, at my day job as dean of AKU, to be able to be in that space where I'm able to positively put nursing and midwifery where it needs to be. But that can only be sustained if each of us are able to play an important role in how we communicate and how we engage so that you know we can do things uh, well. And on a very light note, Sam, it's not very often um, I get compliments about what NCK is doing. So I take that very, very, that compliment extremely seriously. And uh, we continue to work hard together and let's see what the opportunities ahead of us have to offer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eunice. At Sally, you have the floor. Final remarks. Uh, thank you, Sandra. And um, I think I've spoken quite a lot on what we really need to, you know, what we really need as midwives. And I think as Midwives Association of Kenya, we are here to speak for you. And we believe many of you are going to join our association so that at least we are a bigger voice so that we can be heard and be able to provide the quality midwifery and neonatal care that is required to our general population. So um, one still call is ensure that midwives are at the leadership helm. I think that's one of the things that we really, really require as midwives so that we have a better voice. We have more political will at leadership uh, positions. And then two, I'll still re reinforce on licensing that midwives are supposed to be given space and autonomy. And the better way is if we can prove that through midwifery led care, better outcomes are there than obstetric led care, then that would be a better option. And that can only be done if we facilitate our midwives with better um, or lower rates licenses. And of course, when we inspect, we make sure that the Maternity units are uh, are places. They are places that can actually accommodate our women or families, and be able to facilitate better birth outcomes. And three, that we still reinforce or re-emphasize on ensuring that midwives are in the budgeting committees, so that they can be able to refocus the energies where they, it's required, and especially that the, the supplies for midwifery-led activities are actually improved. Thank you very much. And I know as midwives in this forum, we are going to serve because I, I always say, it is the only rent that we pay on this world by serving the population. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eunice. Um, can we have Christine speak and then Edna? Christine, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. You might be muted. Still cannot hear you. If we can have Edna speak and then we'll finish off with Christine. So sorry, Christine. 
Uh, thanks, Sandra. And uh, just colleagues, just before I give my remarks, uh, Atali, thanks for pointing out the conversation of the fees uh, have a stakeholders approach. So we've started that conversation. I think to me, I will try to figure a way of how we need to ensure that we have um, midwifery-led services and autonomy for midwives to practice. And then we come back and discuss the logistics of how to ensure that is. Yeah, so um, please just know that um, fees is something that the council at any time can even Uh, to support the services. Thank you so much for that. But back again to the call of action is uh, first, before I even go to that, just want to appreciate, as Eunice has mentioned, most of the time when I go to the forum, I always are ready to be able to be the firing uh, squad. But I think it's just amazing. And uh, I would just feel very happy to be part of this conversation, to also be able to get positive uh, remarks from our colleagues and also to acknowledge uh, the great work we are all doing together. Remember that it's not only NCK, most of the time, my uh, units and the team at the council, leadership provides leadership to the secretariat, which I had. And myself, I just work through people and with people and anything that I do, I do with the midwives here. So Sami and also colleagues uh, who are pointed out, uh, please, and, and Sally and uh, Sami and everyone that you commended us, it is our concerted depot that we've ensured we do that. Uh, Sandra, allow me again to quickly just uh, comment something about Robert, uh, exactly indicated in the chat box, Robert. Thank you so much. Indeed, you are a nurse midwife. And by now, I think you may even qualify to have the title of midwives because of the years of experience you have learned and also uh, your competencies. I think uh, to us as a council, we'll basically be able to evaluate your current competencies, which is also supported by the years of experience. And if there's anything much you may be having a gap, then we need to pick up that discussion if how then you need to be able to fill in that gap. But otherwise, uh, we'll also welcome suggestions from you. So midwives, we need to speak with one voice. We need to advocate. And I think beyond here, we need to stop talking to ourselves. Today, we are hearing midwives' voices. And the midwives' voices are presented to the midwives. So we are done talking to ourselves. Let us reach out now to the people who influence policy. Let us reach out to the people who influence budget. Let us pick this discussion to the treasury you know, let us pick this discussion to the parliament. Let us pick this discussion to the Public Service Commission, to COG, and also to SRC. So I think beyond the mark and um, also the alliance, let us be able also to map other stakeholders and we start talking to them. To our dear midwives here, let us advocate for midwifery. Let us ask to be accepted within the community. Let the women choose us as their preferred skills health personnel. And let us also pitch what the midwifery led services as the advantages. Not really that we do not, um, we just want to augment the services with our colleagues, not really a competition, but we need to start having this discussion with our colleagues. Let us also have a buy-in within our obstetrician as someone has actually indicated that midwifery led services, our maternity home will be offering pure midwifery led services. If a mother wants to do the CS, we'll be happy to just be able to collaborate with our other uh, skilled health personnel who have those competencies and they've been licensed to. So if we are able to stick, you can imagine your maternity home, women come, they are smiling, you are able to support them, you are allowed to have the dwellers around, the family around, and be able to offer that. That is the only thing we need. Let us pitch what the midwives can offer in this country. And also, finally, let us advocate for each one of us let us support each, each and every one of us and let us also extend what we know today and we share with our other many colleagues that they were not able to be part of this call. Asante Nisana. Thank you so much, Edna. Um, Christine, final remarks? We can hear you lightly. Maybe you can speak a bit louder, but we can hear you. We can, you can just go ahead. after you have done, I think protocol does not allow that. But uh, what I can say is that as midwives, 
we need to take up uh, an active role in advocating for the needs in terms of the supplies, the infrastructure. Don't just take a passive role. You just say gloves are out of stock and you keep quiet. Follow it through, prioritize those things because there are funds specifically for women through the NHIS and the Linda Mama. Make sure you have a share of those funds to improve the services in the maternity. So that is my final thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. And I think we are all in agreement with you. Um, the midwives, and this is the essence of this campaign, the midwives need to play an active role um, in actually pushing for some of these asks that have, have showed up. Um, I really wanna thank um, everyone, starting by from the speakers who have stayed with us till the end of the session. Thank you so much for the time that you have you have given and, and the thoughts and ideas that you've shared in this platform. I have learned a lot, even as an advocate um, for, this, uh, for, for this kind of work because we are non-midwives. And so sometimes we can, like you, you rightfully say that now, we can be talking to ourselves and really need to hear aspects from, you know, both the midwives and actors in the space. So thank you so much um, to the, for the uh, MCK for the, 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 the ideas and the thoughts that you have shared on this platform. Thank you, Christine, from the county, Makwini County government for giving us the reality at that level, because sometimes you can also just be speaking at, you know, the, the clouds there, but we have to really know what happens at the implementing level. So thank you for giving us that perspective. And more importantly, the midwives, who are organized with them uh, through the Midwives Association of Kenya. Thank you so much for, again, validating what has come through this uh, listening exercise. This campaign is a midwife-led campaign. It's a midwife-driven campaign. We are always facilitating that process. Uh, we have learned from this forum that they are, we are not the only actors. And I think that, that one of the running calls that have been uh, mentioned by Eunice um, and the other speakers is, um, the aspect of collaboration, that there are very many, there are diverse actors, critical and diverse actors that are involved in this conversation, spanning from the Ministry of Health, the COG, development partners, um, advocates like ourselves, but more importantly, the midwives who have been called to play an active role. And so for the next um, um, steps, we will be doing, uh, we'll be supporting such processes We've listened and we've outlined the three key asks, what we're calling the three advocacy asks. The first one around uh, supplies and equipment. The second one about, around professional development and um, uh, 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 leadership. And the third one around really just the working environment and enabling a working environment for the midwives. And so that is what we, 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 we also call upon you as midwives and other actors to really walk this journey as well. Uh, we, uh, we, it needs to be collaborative. We need to not be running parallel efforts, uh, as was said earlier on. Uh, we need to be strengthening the advocacy agenda. Also remembering that the momentum that we are building is not just a national agenda. There is currently a movement around midwifery voices that has been running since 2020. And we really want to ensure that in Kenya, we are not left behind, that we are actually leading in that thought, uh, um, thought leadership. We are leading in the practice and the health service delivery that um, we're seeking to achieve. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, you, you will all be receiving the recording from this, uh, from this session. For those whose questions were not answered, we'll, we'll pick them and ensure that we um, uh, uh, reach out to the respective speakers to address those questions and we'll get back to you on that. Um, yeah, I think uh, we are good. We are good to go. And uh, I, I hope we are, we are ready and charged for the next, um, the next step. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for the opportunity. All the best to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks you. so Thank much. You. Thanks so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, you liars with uh, Eunice. Uh, we'll be having discussions on various issues at the council. So Eunice, uh, happy to engage colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edna, and Thank Eunice Birangu and Sandra and all the participants. We really appreciate you as Midwives Association of Kenya and we will help your voice to be amplified in the country. Thank you so much. Sante. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.